Welcome to UCL's Lunch Hours Lectures. Um, I'm Paola Lettieri, Professor of Chemical Engineering at UCL and Director of UCList, our new campus that is being built at the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, as you can see behind me. So today's lecture is part of a series to give you a taste of the academic activities that UCList will encompass. It is the 3rd of December today, and we celebrate the International Day of People with Disabilities. This is an international observance promoted by the United Nations since 1992. So it is fitting that the lecture today is delivered by Professor Kathy Holloway, Academic Director and Co-Founder of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. The GDI Hub, as we call it in short, was developed in collaboration with the London Legacy Development Corporation, born out of the legacy of the London 2012 Paralympic Games. And it brings together partners with world leading exper expertise in disability, including UCL, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, the London College of Fashion, Loughborough University London, Leonard Shetshire, VNA, Sadres Wells, and the Helen Hamlin Center for Design. It is a research and practice center driving disability innovation for a fairer world, and it will be based at UCList when we open in 2022. It currently operates in 33 countries, and it has reached over 1.2 million people directly and another 2.5 million indirectly since its foundation four years ago. And last year, quite excitedly, it launched its flagship program, an MSc in Disability Design and Innovation, led and awarded by UCL, but with teaching across Loughborough London University and the London College of Fashion. So it is a multidisciplinary course where design engineering meets with global policy and the societal context of disability. So in the lecture today, Kathy will address some preliminary research findings of pointing to a new future where assistive technology is a leading component of the innovation industry. So before I hand over to Kathy, let me remind you that you can post your questions on Slido and the passcode is L-H-L-O-T-U-M-N and we will answer them at the end of the talk. So thank you and over to you, Kathy. Thank you, Paola. It's a pleasure to be here um, and a pleasure to be here on, on International Day of Persons with Disability, which as everybody knows is a fantastic time to share some of the great work that has been happening um, across, across UCL, but also across the world with our partners. So as Paula said, I'm Cathy Holloway and I'm very lucky to be the a Professor of Interaction Design and Innovation at UCL's Interaction Centre, but also the Academic Director of the Global Disability Innovation Hub. Um, I'm going to start sharing my screen, so hopefully you can uh, see a short presentation that um, I've put together for you. There's a lot that's in here, so hopefully you will um, have lots of questions and I'll do my best to answer them at the end um, and it can be the start of a, of a conversation for us all. So what am I going to talk about today? Well, first of all, just to introduce people who don't know to the Global Disability Innovation Hub, Paula has done a little bit of that for me, so thank you very much. Um, and then I'm going to move on to talking about assistive technology and why I believe we should all value it. Um, and then look at the changing role of technology and assistive technology, uh, hopefully setting up the premise of my talk about assistive technology being an impact changer for the world. And that's partly going to be helped by um, the new UK aid funded projects, which we at GDI Hub have announced today, which will reach over 10.5 million people globally. And I've smattered those across the presentation. So hopefully you can get as excited as we are about them. So first of all, GDI Hub, um, as Paola rightly said, we were launched to continue disability innovation that was begun by the 2012 London Paralympic Games. And I must say that in an ideal world, I would have been given this um, presentation with my co-founder and co-director, Victoria Austin, who helped to lead the London Legacy Paralympic Games work. However, unfortunately, due to a COVID hospital appointment, she uh, couldn't, couldn't share the stage with me. So I'm going to do my best to give you um, all of the knowledge and the expertise that we have across the partnership and across our, both our brains and, and the organisation brains today. 
So we were established to build a movement to accelerate disability innovation for a fairer world. Now, as we know, London, if you were in London in 2012, what happened for the Olympics and the Power Olympics was a shift in attitudes. People valued uh, disabled people more and people had a different attitude to what it was to be disabled. It was also the first time that the Power Olympics, the Olympics, sorry, was the most accessible, still to this day, London 2012 was the most accessible um, Olympic Games, and it was the most successful Paralympic Games in that people went to see the Paralympics and it was just as big a celebration as the Olympics. And so how do you um, try to continue to build, uh, build on that huge momentum and create a, a global change? That's what we, uh, that's the challenge that we set ourselves. And obviously that would be very difficult without partners. So the Mayor of London through the London Legacy Development Corporation and our partners, UAL, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park, Loughborough University in London, VNA, Sadler's Wells, and then the Cheshire all helped us create this. So when we think about disability innovation, uh, sometimes people might think of a wheelchair, it's a classic thing that people think of, but we think of it as more of a product or service or policy. It's a way of thinking to address disability challenges by co-designing solutions and sharing knowledge. And so it refers to the process of addressing disability challenges uh, within communities and making sure that we share our knowledge to actively promote social justice. We do that mostly in partnerships. We can't do anything without lots of people coming together because disability affects many different facets of society. So in the top left, we have our master's course at World First in Disability Design Innovation. In the top right, we have our friends and colleagues at AMREF International who are delivering our innovation accelerator in Kenya. In the bottom left, we have the work we're doing on NT 2030 with our partners, uh, Kotakita, and, um, and in the bottom right, we have our work uh, with the WHO uh, working on developing the world report on assistive technology which will come out in 2021 or maybe 2022 due to COVID. So part of the work and this is uh, Victoria Austin's work um, from the Paralympics was understanding how do you embed disability inclusion across large major programs and so we do that by following this 10 step process, which has been distilled from the knowledge of what was delivered by um, the London Legacy Development Corporation and the Paralympics more generally. So first of all, setting a clear mission and making sure we get joint objectives, ensuring the strong leadership and scrutiny of that leadership, ensuring the communities um, are part of the participation process, the, the active um, engagement with the participation of, of the community. And, and we know that everybody that's moving to Stratford to the Olympic Park, the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park as part of the UCL East process and as, as, with our partners as well, there's a huge engagement opportunity um, and activities happening at the moment to make sure that um, people feel as part of UCL as we feel as part of East London. A diverse partnerships in, and making sure that all can input into those partnerships, ensuring we've got the right technical expertise, expert technical expertise, you know, GDI Hub now works in 33 countries. We work with different people and different sets of expertise across those countries. And then we develop open access tools. So we have two things coming in the new year. One is an innovator toolkit and, and also a design playbook, which will be um, useful, hopefully, to many entrepreneurs across the world. Um, inclusive innovation is encouraged. We, we uh, try our best to explain this to people at all opportunities so that they can see both the business opportunity, the moral opportunity, but also just why it's actually very good fun. Um, making sure we have data. And, and you know, I'm, I'm a professor, I'm an academic. I care about academic uh, gold standard level of data, but I also appreciate that that takes a long time to get. And that sometimes we have to move forward with good enough data. And so how do we form those partnerships with academic institutions, uh, with industry and, and with partners that need good enough data to make decisions that well, we can then analyze the data later. And then number nine is making sure that there are consequences for failure and making sure we know how to act. Um, when we've established GDI Hub and we've established this, the flagship program 802030 for UK aid, there have been mistakes. Um, and we've had to learn how to, how to act and, and change and, and, and make amends so that we can be, uh, learn from them and, and become uh, stronger and better. And then finally, reward and celebrate success. So we, uh, everybody works incredibly hard and we should make sure that um, that hard work is well rewarded and that the rewards don't just sit at the top. 
Uh, sometimes, you know, we might publish a paper, for example, but we want to make sure that that paper, the data that's in that paper and, and the messaging that's in that paper gets back to the participants, gets back to the communities who helped create it, and if, as much as possible that they are part of the authorship team. So I'm going to move on now to assistive technology. Um, assistive technology, you might have heard of assistive technology, um, a wheelchair perhaps, or a hearing aid. Um, but it's an umbrella term that covers the systems and services related to the delivery of assistive products. So oftentimes people think of assistive technology and they think of the product, but the product is only part of it. If you're given a wheelchair or you're given eyeglasses or you're given um, a hearing aid, they, these things need to be, um, you often need training and they need a service for you to get them. So you need to be screened for them. You need to actually be, have it delivered. You need to be fit. Sometimes you need extensive training depending on the level of disability and the level of assistance. So we have a priority assistive list. When I say we, I mean the global community, which is delivered by the World Health Organization. And it includes uh, devices like the hearing aids, wheelchairs, communication aids, spectacles, artificial limbs, pill organizers, memory aids, incontinence pads even are in there. And all of those um, items are seen by us as part of the global community as essential for people um, to achieve their human rights. Uh, so. When we, when we set up to make sure that people have assistive technology, we are thinking beyond products. So that's the main takeaway of this slide. And so why should you care about assistive technology? Why should anybody care about assistive technology? Well, the good news, if you like, or the bad news is I'm now over the 40 years of age. So that means that all of my functions are declining. I have to now magnify things on my phone, hold glass, hold bottles and things away from me to be able to see. My hearing will begin to go soon. I won't be able to run as fast. Lots of things will begin to get worse. And that happens for all of us. And the combination of that leads to disability. And often, obviously, some people are born with a disability or they acquire a disability earlier in life. But no matter what happens, we will all be increasingly disabled as we age. That's the, that's the good news of my talk, people. Really, so that, but the, it, we lose function, but uh, assistive technology helps us. So we now have a billion people, that's one in seven, that need um, an assistive product. We know from Norway, where it's probably the best assistive technology service in the world is provided through Norway. And on average, people who use assistive technologies there have about 3.2 devices. So a billion people need assistive technology, but that could mean up to 3 billion devices. Now, fast forward to 2050, we're all living a bit longer. People are living with more complicated conditions they might have died of previously. And so that brings us to 2 billion. So that could bring us up to nearly 10 billion products. And so if we get this right and we manage to uh, crack assistive technology and provision, there's two things that we need to keep in mind. One is this demonstrates the need for assistive technology. I think it's clear that we need assistive technology. It doesn't demonstrate demand. It doesn't mean there's anybody that's able to buy assistive products. It doesn't mean that governments are able to buy them for the populations, and it doesn't mean that disabled people are able to buy them. That's the first thing. The second thing is if we crack that demand and we are able to get people to buy these products and we're able to innovate new technologies, new services to supply that demand, we're going to end up with a lot of products. And so long term, we really need to think about the end of life of the products. We can't just be creating devices that are for single use. We are going to have to begin to think about how we create devices which are more repairable in context, that are usable by people in context, that have maybe a central design, but it gets manufactured in different spaces so that we're not flying products all around the world. And that's been borne out in, the, in COVID. A lot of supply chains have failed. A lot of assistive technology supply chains have failed. And the robustness and resilience of supply chains has been shown to, to, to have failed effectively. And so later on in the talk, I'm, go I'm going to come back to that. But for now, I'm going to start on 80, 20, 30 and get back to that first question, which is about need and demand. So 80, 20, 30 stands for assistive technology in 2030, and it's a mission led program where we are trying to change and, and evidence what works in getting assistive technology products to people globally. It is delivered, oh, it's paid for, it's sponsored by the UKA, so FCDO, and we're very grateful to them for that funding. Again, we've applied this 10-step framework into the design and development of AT2030, and we've ended up with four clusters of activity. So the first cluster of activity is around data and evidence, the second is around innovation, the third is around country implementation, and the fourth is around capacity and participation. 
And so I said earlier that um, we demonstrated there's a need, but we've demonstrated there's no demand. No, there's not a demand. So how does each of these clusters help? Well, 80, 20, 30 in innovation helps entrepreneurs and innovations overcome what's called the valley of death. And the valley of death is where you have a proof of concept, you know it's a good idea, but there's, it's very difficult to get it to market. And so lots of innovations die in this valley of death. The second, as I mentioned, was 80, 20, 30, is the country implementation cluster. And that's ensuring a country level systematic response to generate the demand and provide services. Then we have data and evidence, and that is simply constantly researching what works, whether it's for the World Report on Assistive Technology, whether it's we're currently running a, an innovation action for the Kenyan government to map the innovation and assistive technology ecosystem across Kenya, for example. We are reactive and, and proactive in creating data and evidence that will help inform um, policy and practice in this space. And then finally, we have capacity and participation. And there we're looking at changing attitudes and infrastructure to support assistive technology. So for example, we're working in eight countries um, to develop inclusive design work. Uh, so for making cities accessible, for example, so that assist people who use assistive technology can actually use the cities, get around their cities. Um, but also working uh, with the International Paralympic Committee and, and sport to change attitudes through um, Tokyo next year. So I'm going to start with innovation, which is a cluster that I lead, and GDI Hub has been leading innovation initiatives through 802030, supporting companies at different stages. So first of all, we started with our exploration, design and, and development, um, and then moved to validation, and now we're starting the path to scale and then to growth. So this dip that you see in this curve, that is very kindly called the valley of death and lots of innovations die there. And it's known that this value of death is both wider, as in it takes longer in time, and it's deeper, as in it's, you need more investment to get an assistive technology to market rather than, for example, a, a standard healthcare um, technology. So today we've announced um, our new impact fund, which is a pan-African four million pound uh, impact investment fund. Uh, we've made one investment, I'm gonna talk about it in a second, and there's more in progress. And that builds on the work that we started um, with Innovate Now in, in Nairobi, where we've had three cohorts now and supported 15 startups. Um, and, and to support them, we've created this open curriculum um, and toolkit for innovators, which after the current cohort have finished trialing it, will become a public good and be released open source. So Innovate Now has these components. We have an active learning environment. We offer mentorship from across the 802030 partnership, which includes people maybe at, at the World Health Organization, um, right the way down to local charities that are running the live labs. And the live labs are normally clinical partners who uh, can help you understand or validate your assistive technology products. So pre-COVID, the idea of live labs was that it would be a physical space where if, for example, you were developing a new prosthetic limb, you would be able to be in a clinic where people get the prosthetic limb so that you could quickly get um, a feedback both from clinicians and from uh, um, prosthetic users. However, due to COVID, we are now moving to uh, virtual live labs in 2022, uh, 2021 and 2022. Uh, so watch this space for that. It's going to be quite exciting in the digital space. We also do events and, and demo days, and that's run by our partners, AMREF and GDI Hub supports it. For example, we have developed the uh, curriculum. Um, and as I said, we've got now got an AT Impact Fund. So what did we learn? We learned that um, the, the technologies, um, so we, had, we ran three trials with different types of technologies before we started Innovate Now. The first one was a type of wheelchair. The second one was a type of prosthetic. The third one was a type of orthotics, so a device that, that uh, you use to, to uh, support a limb. Um, and we realized that we were brilliant and the Accelerator program is absolutely excellent at getting the proof of concept testing done. So under, making sure that the users do need this product and that it is fit for purpose and it can be manufactured on site and that we can run what are kind of preclinical trials. However, more they needed a lot more investment if they were going to scale. And we also noticed there was a lot of people applying for the Accelerator that actually were post Accelerator. That we, what we could offer in the accelerator, they had already done. And what they really needed was bespoke support to scale their innovation. And so today we have um, the four million pound AT Impact Fund launch. Um, it's gonna scale assistive technology solutions that are designed for low and middle income populations. And it's an investment vehicle. So it combines grant capital with what we're calling scale studio. And scale studio is a venture building support. So delivered by experts in assistive technology, mostly drawn from 80, 20, 30 partnership and GDI hub, as well as Brink who are award-winning 
award-winning innovation, so behavioural innovation experts. And we also have lent on Catalyst Fund, who are very kindly helping us build some of the venture tools that we are using. So our first investment will be on HEREX, and I was really excited that HEREX got through the investment committee because I have known about them and have taught about them for a long time. So HEREX um, is a suite of tools to, um, of hearing products that is established in South Africa. And through the AT Impact Fund, our investment will support the rollout of hearing aid subscription models and distribution across South Africa and Kenya. And critically, we're building in research and venture support. So we are also researching the process, but we're also giving them tools to develop research as well as developing their venture support. So it brings a new hearing solution to LMICs. It's the first of its kind in terms of AT subscription. So one of the things, it, it, if you're me, uh, you, I, I receive probably 20 to 100 emails every week with a new innovation. Uh, somebody has created a new smart cane, somebody has created some new smart glasses, somebody has a new tool for automating um, hearing sign language interpretation, for example. And the problem is that all there's no there's no end to the ingenuity of people. Um, so people keep creating these these, these really great um, technologies, these great inventions. The problem though is that as I mentioned, there's no there's nowhere to um, nobody to buy them. So disabled people are generally poor and they generally live in poor low income settings. And there's this, this chronic link between if you're disabled, you're more likely to be poor, and if you're poor, you're likely to be disabled. And so at an individual level, it's very difficult to procure something, very difficult to buy something. And then obviously it's not everybody, but generally it's very difficult. And assistive technology often is seen as sort of governments um, and, and major purchasers, they often don't understand the value of assistive technology. And so uh, we, are off, we are working with HEREX to develop a subscription model. So we're looking at novel financing for the sector to try and unlock this so it will enable tech-enabled diagnostics. That means that health workers, just lay health workers, can provide hearing aids. So it, it task shifts. We don't need such a high level of, um, of clinical expertise to provide the hearing aid. It's, we're testing the novel distribution, uh, which is similar to what was tested for solar home system distributors in, in Kenya before, across Africa before, and again, testing the subscription model to overcome the affordability barrier. So what do we unlock? Well, hopefully we'll unlock a uh, self-sustaining demonstration of distribution and subscription models working in LMICs in low and middle income countries. And we believe this model can be widely scaled up across Kenya and other African countries. And it would unlock the market opportunity of 97% of people in LMICs who need hearing aids but can't access them. And so going back to our four clusters, that's, that's just a dip, in, like a dip in the ocean, if you like, of what we're doing in, in innovation. I just want to come back to um, the country capacity and update you on what we've been doing to help a top-down level. So this demand, we can keep helping innovators and we can develop new finance models and we can test all of that, but it, won't, it, 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 it will only help so much if we don't have country-level investment. And so what we have been working with, with our friends and colleagues at the Clinton Health Access Initiative and the World Health Organization is developing country capacity assessments, which have now been complete, and then helping countries develop action plans and then finally giving country investments. We were initially going to give three country investments. However, we, we've increased that. So the country investment uh, process worked um, alongside the research process. So the idea was that we had a phase one application. We, we researched the framework. We had a research framework development based on that application. Then we had phase two applications, but we, we rolled out some participatory development and refinement of the research approach. So we were trying to help governments and, and people who uh, put forward their proposals to understand the value and benefit of research and how research could be embedded into their proposals so that they would have more evidence to better inform their policy. And we're now at this stage where we've allocated funding um, and obviously we'll move forward to country implementation. So it's a delight to just, I just want to thought it would be useful to um, tell you who we worked with just and, and the various uh, different countries that have been involved in the process. So within the WHO Ciro region, we have been uh, working in Indonesia and that was with our friends and colleagues at the Development Planning Unit in the Bartlett at UCL. So they did a, a a study on informality, which can be found on the 802030 website, is well worth a read. 
Um, in the Wipro region, we have worked on Mongolia and Vietnam, and then we have also been working in Bolivia and the Dominican Republic. So CHAI then, the Clinton Health Access Initiative, uh, took on the lead in Africa um, and have um, developed these country capacity assessments in Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Ethiopia, Malawi, Rwanda and Uganda. And so I suppose it's worth just mentioning what is a country capacity assessment. It's really looking at the policy, looking at the budget, looking at the processes, seeing do you have, does a country have a policy for delivering assistive technology? Does that sit within education? Does it sit within health? Does some of it sit within ICT? How well is the budget coordinated? How well is it monitored? What happens if it's not delivered in, 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 a, in a meaningful way? And then realizing okay so there are some bits of the jigsaw present but, but there are different bits of the jigsaw that need to be added and then helping to develop the the country implementation plan and then some people some countries have, have bid also and been successful for the um, country investment fund and so what we've realized is that just through doing this process even before you get to giving people um, the money or the countries the money there's been increased engagement momentum and awareness at a country level there's a much greater in government and across departments that maybe or ministries that previously didn't really understand the benefits of technology of both the opportunities and the barriers within their country um, and the national action plans are beginning to um, to roll out which is fantastic to see and so today we uh, make a one million pound investment um, uh, which has been followed the competitive process I've just mentioned uh, into Liberia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone and Nigeria to trial strategic methods of reaching more people with access to assistive technology. And as I've said, they build on the country capacity assessments carried out under 182030 with national governments using the World Health Organization tools and working with Chai, Maynooth University, who are helping us with and leading on the policy research side a GDI hub um, as well, supporting those activities. So here are the four countries. In the top left, we have Liberia, where we'll be working to establish a cross-sectoral AT technical working group, develop an integrated national priority assisted product list. So those product lists might not sound very exciting if you don't know about a product list, but it helps if you're a government and you don't know what products are the most useful to your country. It, it can be a real stumbling block to the procurement process. So making sure that there's an integrated national priority assisted product list is, is, is critical to success. We're creating national assisted product standards or supporting the government too, um, and building AT coordination. Um, and then down in Nigeria, uh, we're looking to support a unified AT strategy and to help improve data to inform the country needs as well as increase the availability of quality assistive devices and mobilize financial resources. Up in Sierra Leone, we're establishing a secretariat role for the country's inaugural National Disability Assistive Technology and Rehabilitation Technical Working Group, as well as developing a national AT program, supporting revision of the population census and developing an AT strategy and policy and tools for disability and AT data collection. And finally, um, down in Rwanda, we're developing a national AT data system and national guidelines and systems for assistive products and improving the coverage of AT in the national health insurance package and strengthening the national coordination mechanism yeah, mechanisms around AT, I can't say that word. So this is, this is a huge opportunity for us. And, and the key part of this is that whether it be the GDI hub or Main Youth University or the Clinton Health Access Initiative or the WHO, all we are doing is helping to support the, the national level um, infrastructure. So all of these initiatives are being led by um, the governments and, and the national actors, and we are simply adding a support infrastructure to help these things occur. Okay, so I'm going to I'm going to change tact again, go back to our four uh, clusters. And this time I'm going to just want to talk through data and evidence. So data and evidence um, is, is one of those key things that we're, we're scurrying around behind the scenes, desperately trying to do a couple of things. One is to landscape what's out there and what are the barriers. So we, um, we've paired up, we did pair up with the Clinton Health Access Initiative and the GDI Hub worked together to create what are called product narratives. So they're led by Chai, who have done this for many other medical uh, devices before. And what a product narrative does, I'd recommend that you read one. Honestly, I've got many of them lying around the place here. Um, but they help understand what are the barriers to um, innovation and to product provision and service within a particular product. 
So we looked at prosthetics, which seem probably like an assistive technology you would think about, wheelchairs, eyeglasses, and hearing aids. However, we also looked at digital assistive technology and commissioned a piece of work with GSMA on understanding the mobile disability gap. And these two products that have come out, the understanding the mobile disability gap alongside the digital um, product narrative demonstrate the power of mobile. So one of the studies, I, it's one of my studies in, in Kibera, which is an informal settlement in Kenya. When you go to Kibera, when you go to Kenya um, and, you, and you talk with people, people might not have access to running water and they might not have access to a toilet and they might not have access to reliable electricity, but they have a mobile phone. And oftentimes that mobile phone is their link to the rest of, of the world. And we've demonstrated in previous studies that I don't have to, through AT2030, which I don't have time to talk about today, that a mobile phone acts as an accessibility bridge uh, for people with mobility impairments. So it allows people who physically can't leave their home to get access to products and services that they need and education and even livelihoods uh, within informal settlements. We've also demonstrated that the nature, the reason um, mobile phones um, work so well is because there is this infrastructure support to help people know about them and learn from them. And so part of this digital, I suppose it's a transformation, has led to the World Health Organization um, launching today the Digital and Assistive Technologies for Aging Initiative. So it's learning from the GATE initiative for those of you who have um, been fond members of the GATE initiative for many years. This is Chapal Kanapsis, who works at the World Health Organization's group that has spearheaded the momentum in assistive technology globally for decades now. And the changing nature of two things, of three things really. Firstly, we have an aging population. Secondly, we have a digital transformation. And thirdly, we have a huge lesson to learn from COVID. So COVID-19 has taught us that digital literacy is essential, uh, both for assistive technology uh, provision and, and services, but also that many services can be delivered digitally. Um, and also the aging population has, has been a challenge to that digital literacy. We have people that currently are unable to use digital products. And so therefore healthcare and um, services have been um, hidden from them during the time of COVID. There's also a huge opportunity within digital um, in terms of how we how we transform our manufacturing um, processes and, and also our service delivery more generally. So WHO data, uh, this new initiative uh, launched by us today in, in The Lancet, is looking to encourage the development, synthesis and use of solutions that promote access to affordable quality digital and assistive technologies. And those are gonna be for people with impairment or decline in physical or mental capacity but with a particular focus on older people. So within the WHO, data brings together perspectives from a number of different departments, including aging and life course, digital health and innovation, health systems and service provision, health products, and policy and standards. And so we're working with service providers and users with industry and civil society to span boundaries to produce more integrated and cohesive services for older people. As I've mentioned before, it builds on the successful WHO global collaboration cooperation of an assistive technology and healthy aging initiatives and similarly would be applicable to low income and middle income and high income contexts. So I mentioned before um, the role of COVID in, in some of this work and here's a snapshot of some of the papers that have come out of, in part from AT2030 and, and in part from, from other projects where we have looked at assistive technology within the space of COVID and what we have found is that um, it's allowed us to show that I suppose COVID-19 is in a way a social disability. So in our article in the BMJ Global Health, we look at what does it mean to have a social disability and, and also what are the opportunities um, for people to understand disability better. So the COVID-19 experiences may offer contextual knowledge of the pre-pandemic lives of persons with disability and foster greater social awareness, responsibility and opportunities for change towards a more inclusive society. So this more inclusive society we've also seen in our mobile research where we demonstrated that it's the fabric of a community and, and the integration of a mobile phone technology within that fabric of the community that helps it, um, helps it be used and, and, be, and be easy to use. 
Um, we also conducted a rapid global survey on assistive technology use and provision during COVID-19 and effectively demonstrated that there was huge disruption of services and that there was inefficient emergency preparedness, that there's limitations in the existing technology and in inadequate policies and systems. And, and finally, we have demonstrated that we need to develop inclusive, resilient COVID systems. And one of the platforms that we've launched is called innovationaction.org. And that's a collaboration between the 802030 programme and a programme called COVID Action. Both programmes are funded by FCDO UK Aid. And what we're looking at, what we realised was that when we'd been, when we did all the product narratives on prosthetics, on, on wheelchairs, on eyeglasses, on hearing aids, there was, there was a kind of a, an undercurrent through all of these product narratives that said actually if you look at the way that digital manufacturing systems are going it should be possible to design a product in one place and it be made in many other places we shouldn't have to mass manufacture anymore we can distribute manufacture and if we distribute manufacture then people would have, be able to use it locally they'd be able to repair it locally they'd be able to make use of local materials um, and and when, we, when we investigated that through 802030, we found with our work with Motivation Wheelchairs and their new Innovate Wheelchair platform, that when people could use local materials and people could make their wheelchair locally, that the service had a much better understanding of assistive technology and much better understanding of how to repair the device when it failed, and of course it will fail, but also the user felt far more included because they were given a bespoke service. So we kept seeing this undercurrent of what would happen if we looked at distributed manufacturing systems, digital manufacturing systems, and then COVID came along and COVID Action, a new project came along. And what was found was the same problems were being seen in personal and protective equipment uh, supply chains. So the problems we'd seen that underpinned the chronic failures within assistive technology system were also seen within personal protective um, equipment, as well as ventilators and other healthcare products due to COVID. And so the idea of innovation action is that we have a one, one central repository of innovation sites, of local manufacturing sites, and eventually a suite of products that you could download from the site and be able to manufacture wherever you are in the world. And therefore, people that have pivoted into creating PPE across Africa, and there's been many brilliant examples of PPE production across Africa, that's not hopefully sustainable. Hopefully we will have a vaccine and, and we will be able to overcome the, the trials and tribulations we've had as a society for COVID. And therefore there's an opportunity for those, those manufacturers to now start creating um, assistive technology. And so the Innovation Action Portal, which is um, will help us to empower people and move that forward, we hope. We're also working right at the frontiers of technology. So we've developed, um, which will be launched next year, an AI powered interactive web platform. So that's with our friends at the UNESCO uh, Center for AI, as well as the Joseph Stefan Institute and the European Disability Forum, where we're basically scraping any article that has been written about assistive technology across the world in any language into one central place. So at the moment that scraping is working. We, we, use, um, we use Wikipedia as an interim, but Wikipedia, we use the Wikipedia library to basically get every single possible word that's associated with the words that we've given it. And then it comes back with every single article that we need. And now we're working on how do we uh, make sense of those articles so that we can begin to demonstrate where certain clusters of innovation are happening, where there's innovation, there's a lack of innovation. Um, and in the new year, we will also be rolling out uh, not just media sources, but also all academic papers so that we will be able to um, demonstrate that where, where there's opportunity and, and where the barriers are to innovation from the evidence that is being collected around the world every day. As part of that initiative, we um, held a global roundtable with over 30 experts from a number of countries. And, um, to decide what are the key challenges in AI that could best match um, the problems faced in assistive technology. This data portal was one idea which we started and the others will be launched um, later with the UNESCO Center formally opens. So I'm uh, getting close to wrapping up and moving uh, to questions, but before I do that, I just want to mention the final um, thing that we are launching today as GDI Hub. And that's with our founding partner, Loughborough University, looking at stigma. So we know that stigma is one of the biggest issues faced by disabled people. And so we also know, when I say we, it's really um, Vicky's side of the organization, knows that the experience of London 2012 um, can have on making, if you take, if you use disability positively, what change that can have. 
And so working alongside the International Paralympic Committee, Loughborough University, we're bringing the Tokyo Paralympics to up to 150 million people for the first time in free to air broadcast in at least 22 new countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And we've been supported in doing that by Hogan Lovell's uh, legal team who have very kindly helped us with all of the, the difficulties in negotiating some of, the, some of the contracts in that area. And Loughborough University are embedding a research program around that, that, that free to view, but also around the schools program that will be rolled out at the same time. So that is a further £1 million investment into changing attitudes on assistive technology. All of this work is only possible with all of our partners, and we are incredibly grateful and very lucky to work with each and every one of them. They range from very high level uh, people uh, like uh, the UNICEF, for example, which is a global organisation, to small um, country level research centres like the Sierra Leone Urban Research Centre. But it is a, a, a proper, um, we, we like to say in UCL, a partnerships of equivalence and every single partnership here has an equivalence. We, each member gives as much as they receive from the partnership and, and we would just like to take a moment to acknowledge um, all, of, all of the great people we're very lucky to work with. And so finally, if you want to know more, follow us on Twitter. Uh, if you get look at the hashtag IDDP, hashtag IDPWD, then you will um, be able to capture uh, all of the, the growing news today on uh, International Day of Persons with Disability. And if you'd like to know more about GDI Hub, please do look at our website, disabilityinnovation.com, and in particular, our impact report from 2019-2020. And with that, I shall close um, and hopefully uh, answer some questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cathy, for this really fascinating lecture. And what an incredible set of initiatives uh, and how impressive what the GDI Hub really has been able to achieve in only four years since it was founded. Gosh, you must have worked tremendously hard. We've got a few questions on Slido, so I'll um, read them out for you. So the first question is, how would you suggest the countries decide who gets the technology? That's a very good question. Um, as a, as a a uh, person of UCL, I would say the, the greatest uh, good for the greatest number. And that's quite a difficult, um, it's a difficult equation to have. And it's, and it's more complicated for governments because, you know, you've got that budget alongside should you um, invest in HIV medication or NETS to prevent malaria, you know. So, so, these, so people are making very, very difficult decisions. I would say that, um, that the key part is to work with disabled persons organizations or uh, organizations for persons with disability because they know what is needed on the ground um, and to develop to co-develop that assistive priority list so decide as a country what is right uh, for your country so your country might have had uh, a difficult time during war and have a high number of amputees for example or you might have an increasing aging population or you might have a very young population we know that covid maybe in, in africa for example isn't as problematics that people get it they're younger that the overall population is younger so I think if you work together with persons with the organizations that know disabled people best but also make sure that you bring in a couple of other organizations so in Sierra Leone I know the work that Victoria Austin and the DPU have been doing um, has looked at bringing in people like Slum Dwellers International so you find that Slum Dwellers International maybe they didn't understand that disability was such an important thing. So you begin to help build um, kind of a, a bit of a disruptive partnership, not a partnership that's going to disrupt people, but that helps to challenge your own thinking. So also challenge persons with you know, the organization's thinking. But I think if you have the persons with disability there represented um, and you have the people who deliver your health and education system, as well as the ICT system and, and the built infrastructure, and you co-design it together and set a, an ambitious mission that you're all behind, um, then the right decisions will be made locally at the right time. Fantastic, thank you. So can you, a second question, can you tell us more about your MSc in Design and Disability and what opportunities it may give to students to become involved with some of the initiatives that you've talked about? Sure. So the MSc Disability Design and Innovation um, is, as Paula said, it's awarded by UCL, but it's, um, it's co-delivered by Loughborough University and London College of Fashion. And in the first year, you get to learn about uh, future global technologies for disability and development. And that is a crash course in international development theory and policy, because a lot of technology doesn't, isn't fit for purpose in the uh, context. 
So if you want to design assistive technologies and you want to design solutions for disabled people then, or people with disabilities, then you have to know that you're designing mostly in low and middle income countries, but also even in high income countries, you're often designing um, at the bottom of the pyramid. So in order to do that, um, you learn about international development, you learn about um, the, the basics of design thinking, design systems thinking from an engineering point of view, as well as, um, as, well as some critical knowledge on uh, innovation practices. And then alongside that, you learn um, research methods and making, which is all about how do you actually research these topics? How do you make products? And, and how do you, um, how do you, what, this kind of, it's like a toolkit, a Swiss army knife of tools that you can go and apply to any problem. Um, and, the, and our partners, Loughborough, do a brilliant project in the first term on uh, design systems thinking. And that's followed up with a collaborative project in the second term, where you actually start to apply some of these skills in a group with a local, um, local disability group. Um, and then London College of Fashion come in and help you. So people um, smiled when I first said London College of Fashion are going to deliver the innovation entrepreneurship bit. They're going to do the marketing and business planning. And, and some people at UCL said, oh, we've got, a, you know, got an entrepreneurship faculty department. We've got, you know, links with um, London Business School. Like, why, why would we go to London College of Fashion? But the thing about London College of Fashion is uh, fashion gets everywhere. You know, if I'm in a, an informal settlement in Kibera, people still want a Nike pair of shoes or they want an Adidas T-shirt. You know, nobody, and so they know how to crack uh, mass manufacturing, but they also know how to crack bespoke business models. And oftentimes, if you look at traditional entrepreneurship and innovation kind of programs, everything's about the, the unicorn, you know, getting a billion dollars, spinning your, in, your innovation out. But actually, in assistive technology, the business models are very different. You know, we're looking at much longer returns on investment. We're looking at how you get your money is very different. So London College of Fashion have just literally torn up the rule book and created a whole new, um, whole new uh, curriculum, which is our, all of our students seem to thrive on. And then obviously your dissertation. Um, in terms of what does that mean for you? Um, it means you get to hear about these products in great depth. So Victoria Austin, Ian McKinnon, who are both leading elements of Victoria leads the whole 80 20, 30 program, but uh, they lead modules and lead parts of modules. So you, you get to hear about that directly. Um, you get to work with people, other students that are a really wonderful, diverse mix. We have everything from physiotherapists to people who work in government policy landscape to um, computer scientists to psychologists uh, all coming on the programme. So there's a lot of interdisciplinary learning. And then a lot of our dissertation projects are linked to our research. You get kind of seconded into that project and you get to work with that. Hopefully that answers your question. It sounds really fantastic. Thank you, Kathy. So the next question, um, can you, tell us, can you tell us more on um, how the public can participate in testing the assistive technologies that you have presented? That's an amazing question because uh, we are, we, we, you've mentioned, Paolo, we've been a bit busy in the last four years. I don't think we uh, expected to be this busy and we've grown quite rapidly. And, and we had a, a strategic review session a few weeks ago. Um, and one of the things that have come out of that thinking, uh, subsequent thinking has been, that we really do need to develop an idea we've had for a long time, which has had um, a, a, a kind of a, a, a global pool of assistive technology testers, if that makes sense. So people that can give us ideas, but also we'd work with people to co-design them and develop them. Um, so that will, I hope, be rolling out in, in 2022. For now, if you're really interested, just, just drop us an email and go to the GDI Hub website. You can email me if you want at c.holloway.ucl.ac.uk, but you're probably better off going to the general GDI Hub one uh, so that it gets to the right person. Um, and if you just send us an email, uh, we'll, when we are designing this, uh, we will be designing it with a few people. So we will be designing it with members of the public to see how it would work. And, and, and the, the main thing for us is to make sure people's time isn't taken for granted, but equally we don't have a huge pot of money to pay people. So we've been thinking about reward structures where maybe, for example, you help us with something, we help you with something else. You know, there, there's more of a, a sort of exchange rather than a monetary uh, incentive. Great. So one final question on Slido. Um, thank you for an information field talk. I was wondering if you could share your thoughts, uh, in difference if any, about creating and distributing assistive technology to those with invisible disabilities uh, compared to visible ones. Yes, yeah, so, um, uh, it's, yeah, it's more of a challenge, uh, invisible disabilities. So invisible disabilities are, are, are ones that are not obvious 
from sites. So um, neurodiversity is often um, mentioned or mental health illnesses um, separately. Um, I think the, the biggest problem with, um, with developing services for, um, for invisible disabilities is partly actually stupid, they're invisible. So people, it's more easy for people to hide. And so therefore self stigma can be a problem. You know, if you have a mental health issue, you can feel ashamed of having a mental health issue. And of course you shouldn't feel ashamed, um, but, but it can happen. Um, and so, and then sometimes you, you know, you might come out and tell somebody that you've got this mental health illness or you, you, you know, you might be on the autistic spectrum or some other uh, invisible disability and you might not get the support that you need. And that's normally due to the fact that people haven't got a clue what to do. So I think the most important thing when it comes to all assistive technology is education. I think when people really understand um, the nature of impairment and the nature of how society can increase impairment or, or, or make the experience of a person's life worse and then for better, most people want to help people and not in a charity way. They just want to, to level the playing field for people. So. Um, I think that the most important thing is open, honest communication, um, making sure that people uh, and, and, and those uh, people, people who do have an invisible disability, make sure that they talk about what they need, ask for what they need. I've, I've had people before um, that I've worked with that maybe have had a, a an invisible disability and they've not told us and then it's very difficult to know what to do if you don't know like it's, it's hard but i think the, the main thing is um campaign so ucl now has, has signed up to do the um sunflower um lanyard scheme for example to help uh, demonstrate um support for for people with invisible disabilities but it is it is challenging and i think it's also challenging when there's multiple disabilities um you know that's also a, a large challenge and at the moment i think assistive technologies for people who are neurodiverse or uh, people with mental health illnesses lag behind those with people who have um, physical or sensory disabilities and it's probably the area that will increase rapidly most rapidly I i'm watching a nice trend at the moment of entrepreneurs spinning out new products and a lot of people who are doing this have adhd and they're creating products that's because they're, they're learning it didn't work for them so they've now created you know different digital tools that help support their learning and I think as, as stigma decreases there'll be more of this innovation uh, which will be a good thing but it is a challenge. Thank you Kathy. I said that that was the last question but if I could ask you the very last question which has appeared on Slido you mentioned the sustainability of technology in terms of end of life of products so is there work on the sustainability of the products to make them in a sustainable way, perhaps from waste or common materials in each of the areas in which you work from for local distributors to access? Yeah, so we're, we're growing that area is what I can say. So we're, we're, we're writing a couple of grants at the moment to try and get some money <laughs> to do more work. We have a number of emerging small tests that show that this is uh, very worthwhile. So um, some of it's in the COVID space. So Ben Oldfrey, who is at the, between GDI Hub and the Institute of Making has been working across 80, 20, 30 and COVID action. And he has been demonstrating the power of local production systems uh, for COVID. And we have now been looking at how that would work for prosthetics, for example. Um, we've also been looking, um, we're about to lead a piece of work with the International Society of Prosthetics and Orthotics, um, ISPO, to look at, Trans getting consensus on digital transformation across the prosthetic services and part of that work is that digital services would provide the ability to embed better end of life care and recycling and, and repairability in, in, uh, in place. I think that there's, there's always a tension and a fear. Uh, innovators and entrepreneurs want to just get tech to people, uh, they're desperate to get tech to people and of course clinicians have, have an oath to do no harm and, and so the idea of somebody hacking their own leg or their own wheelchair kind of fills clinicians with dread um, but if people could repair locally it, it would really make a big difference to the supply chain network um, and, and I think would, would be a it, it also demonstrates the ability for countries every country I go to India Kenya doesn't matter where it is in their in their global strategy is or their national strategy is manufacturing so if they can if people can if any country <laughs> UK now, manufacture, we wish to export, right? So that's, that's what people want to do and, and, and decrease the number of imports or, or kind of um, reliance on imports, I suppose, for key services. 
And I think that the end of life work repairability alongside that, um, with that vision helps countries actually establish manufacturing that can work uh, because not everything has to be done in country, but, but some of it can be done. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kathy, really for Pleasure, sharing uh, all of this amazing work uh, with, with us. Uh, unfortunately, we'll have to stop now. The next uh, lunch hour lecture will be on the 8th of December and will address the question of the effectiveness of private schools. So thank you everyone for being with us today and goodbye. <laughs>